Welcome to Season 5 of She Ventures. I am your host, Doria Lavanino. She Ventures is a podcast about women and their work and life pivots. I believe in the power of storytelling. I also believe that if you change one woman's life, you start to change a family or a community. Our mission is to elevate the diverse stories of everyday women in their work. One promise, no mansplaining ever. Sit back, listen, and hit subscribe. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us at sheventurespodcast.com. This woman started her financial planning company, TimeWise Financial, almost two decades ago. Her pivot is one of increased entrepreneurial clarity and purpose, as she describes it. I've become more intentional in who I choose to work with, leaning toward high-producing moms and women who feel judged by their success. Here to speak about how she built her practice and honed in on her ideal client, certified financial planner, Deanna LaRue. Deanna, welcome to She Ventures. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was really exciting for me to, I always research my guests before speaking with them. And it was refreshing to see a woman who actually stayed in the career that she studied in college and and built on that. It's very unusual. Yes, I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Was that luck or did you just have such clarity about your professional path? I don't think... I had necessarily the clarity or the luck. It actually, I started out as a financial advisor's assistant when I got out of college and had graduated with my finance degree. And the world of finance, I could have done so much with that degree. And so I guess it was a bit of luck getting that first job because as her assistant, I could very quickly see, I, I want to be that person. I want to be the advisor. This is definitely for me and just continued on with it since then. It was a a mentorship experience, really, of seeing another woman running her own business that gave you the the courage and the, the willingness to try it on your own. Absolutely. And I didn't at first try it on my own. I was at the time 24 So I first went and got a job at a big wire house as a financial advisor and got all of my licenses to be able to trade. And that very quickly showed me that I also didn't want to work for anybody else. (laughs) What is it like working for a wire house? Well, working for the wire house was much different. They had, for instance, mandatory Saturdays which I knew that one day I was going to want to have a family and that wasn't going to be what I wanted to do. They had cold calling for a list of their prospects that had already been called 20, 30 times. And that's who they were wanting me to reach out to. And that sounds like fun. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, they also had their own way of doing things. They're Sometimes they have their own proprietary investment vehicles, and I wanted more for the clients that I was going to be bringing on board, and I wanted to do it my way. I wasn't planning on asking this question, but I think it is important for listeners to understand the difference between a broker-dealer and a CFP, and that you have what's called a fiduciary responsibility towards your client. Can you explain that? So being a certified financial planner just means that I have even more people looking over me to make sure that I'm doing what is in the best interest of my clients. Having that, making sure that I'm not just placing trades and I'm, I'm not just looking at this one account for my clients, but I'm looking full at the whole entire picture. Which I think we all can say, maybe it's changed now, but certainly even five or 10 years ago, large companies push certain things to sell. And if you're working at said company, I don't believe, well, I hope 
people wouldn't do things that aren't in their client's best interest. But I would imagine the broker would have that pressure that you don't have. Is that is that accurate? So being independent means that I can go and choose from the whole world of investments, selecting what is specifically in the best interest of my client, not what is going to make me more money or in the best interest of my broker dealer or wirehouse. And tell me about starting your own business. What was that like? So I assume it was after the wirehouse, you got your licenses and then how did that go? So it was uh, very scary for, I'm a risk taker. So I trusted myself in, in taking this venture. My husband at the time was like, what are you doing? What are you, you're going to do what by yourself? And starting it on my own meant reinventing the wheel. I didn't just get a manual of here's the procedures here's how to open a 401k, here's how to talk to your clients, you should invest in A, B, or C shares. I had to go and reinvent the wheel, which I'm so grateful for because it forced me to learn every single facet of my business to be able to better serve my clients. So it was tough in the beginning. I think the biggest hurdle was you're selling yourself and getting out there in front of clients and getting getting people to trust you with their life savings. I was a 24-year-old girl. When I'd, I'd have a prospect come into my office and they'd look over the desk at me and say, so where did you go to college? And what is your experience? And so that was definitely challenging in the beginning, having to show my worth a lot more than I'm sure someone that had a, some gray hairs and a little bit more experience under their belt. And maybe even a Y chromosome, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, goes without saying. I can imagine that was very challenging. And so People today talk a lot about imposter syndrome, and it almost sounds a bit almost like that, like you, you felt like you had to keep proving yourself to your customers. I did. I, I even, I would wear my hair up in a bun. And now being 42, I actually do need glasses, but at the time I didn't. And I'd put blue blockers on and and making myself look older, and I would wear suits to every meeting, in which all of that has drastically changed. I am who I am now, but at that point in time, I, I did have to work harder to prove my worth. How does it start? I mean, doing B2C in any, any way is difficult, and it's expensive. So do you start by just family and friends and advertising, and then it's more of referral over time? How did that work? Yeah, first, I, I avoided family and friends. <laughs> right. I, uh, my mentor at the time had taught me that they would probably be my toughest clients bringing on board and expectations would be different. How it started was I would be very committed to each year I would run a different kind of marketing campaign. So one year I literally went out to all of the coffee shops and libraries and I would post and host these monthly educational seminars. I'd get maybe five to 10 people coming to these and out of those, maybe one, if that would convert. One year, I just focused on direct mail and started sending information to new homeowners coming into the area and trying that. So I didn't want to just try something once and give it up. I wanted to commit for the year. When I teach and mentor other advisors in my field, I tell them that there is no one golden ticket. There is no one rainmaker that's going to make all of the clients come in. It's about paying your dues and being committed to your process 
and believing in yourself and trying it all. And so all of those efforts over the years have grown my business to be very successful now. What I was thinking about is when you mentioned doing the one-on-one or the, excuse me, the conferences, you know, the small conferences where you might've had five people or 10 people. And I think about it in today's terms with digital marketing, even if you did have one person convert, it's still, if it were 10 people, it's a 10% conversion rate, which is actually quite high though. I guess the time, right. The time that you had to dedicate was considerable. It's interesting. Did one or the other end up you say a combination, but is there one that works particularly well for you today? Well, a lot of it's now based on referrals because I've had my my practice for this year will be 18 years, a lot based on referrals. And But at the time, the one that actually worked the best was hosting what I called roundtables for corporations. For instance, Coca-Cola I'm located in Atlanta, so it was corporate for Coca-Cola, and I would learn all of their benefits packages and be able to explain if someone had gotten laid off, unfortunately, or had been there for 20, 30 years and had all of these different buckets of money. I've got my pension, I've got my 401k, I've got an IRA, a CD, but I think I'm going to be okay, right? But where am I supposed to take it from? And and I'd be able to go into those groups and explain their their benefits to them and show them that they will be okay, but this is why and this is how. And that word of mouth, those referrals were the biggest at that point in time. That is incredible and such a great idea. And I I love how financial education, which I feel is really lacking in our society today. I know that a lot of high schools are trying to, in some states, I think it's like 22 have a mandated personal finance course, but really it's almost as if we're expected to know what to do. My mom was a CPA. My dad was an entrepreneur. So I just happened to be raised in a family where money was talked about. But if you're not, it can be a very taboo topic What I was wondering is with women as your primary clients, as I understand it, almost two decades of working with women and their financial planning, are there common issues or roadblocks that you've observed with your female clients specifically? Yeah, with the female clients, especially the highly driven working mom female clients, there are a lot of roadblocks, uh, hurdles. I think a lot of them, if they're self-employed, they they may have done brilliant with their fashion line or brilliant with whatever business they have. And they are often expected, because they've done so well for themselves, to know all about taxes and to know what a mutual fund is. I see them. They feel very intimidated by that. And they feel less than if they don't understand that. And so they often hide a lot of those feelings. And my book of business is very well-rounded. I have women, I have couples, I have kids. But over the past five years, I've been being more intentional on who do I really now growing my business who do I want to work with? And I had decided that I wanted to work with more people like myself that I, I resonate with. And, and being a, a mom, a wife, Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, and a business owner, a leader of the team, it does. It, it comes with judgment as you get more successful and a lot of different expectations. And so working with them has has really been feeding my soul. That is what it's all about, right? At the end of the day, feeding your soul. I don't think you can get better than that. If you were to think about each decade, this is a question I wanted to ask you. So for women in each decade of their life, starting from teenagers, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, because people are living 
very long lives now, and they're planning financial stability. What is one piece of advice that you would, or tip, what is one tip that you would give for each of those decades? So for for a teenager, for example, what is one tip that you would give a young woman who is a teen? So being a young woman as a teen would be to step out of your comfort zone and take a risk. So for instance, at that point in time, I bought my first house when I was 19 years old. And in my group of friends, that was unheard of. That allowed me, though, to get roommates to help me pay the bills while I was going through college. And after I graduated college, then I could sell that as an asset, which has led into equity built up to my current dream home now. So at that point in time, my advice for a young adult would be to start your assets with your your first house and start building that equity. Equity is so key. And what would you say to a 20-something? And I'm thinking also of a lot of people who seem to be really affected by student loan debt. So they might be weighing in their mind, okay, equity versus paying off my debt, which one do I do? And I'm sure it varies by situation. Definitely. every Everybody's situation is different in the world of finance. And my advice for the 20-something would be that if they do have that, that student loan, I would like to come up with debt and savings goals for my younger clients. And I like to be working on two at a time. So maybe we are chunking off that student loan debt, but at the same time, if they're employed and their employer is saying, if you save 4% of your paycheck, then I'm going to match you 4%. That's a a 100% return right away. And so I always advise them at minimum, put in that 4% and get that free money because the younger that you can start saving, the more we all hear that it compounds and the more time it has to grow. And to your point, if you start saving when you're 25, that compounding, assuming that I think invested in equities, which tends to have a rate of return, I think historically of seven or 8%, right? Correct. Correct. It ends up really adding up. Even five years makes a tremendous difference. It's huge. And I've seen all walks of life. I've seen clients come in and they just started saving at age 50 and they're kicking themselves in the behind gosh, I wish someone would have taught me. And to your point, we aren't taught this. I was blessed because I chose finance as my my degree and my education. But you're right, we aren't taught this. And if our parents didn't teach us as kids and our schools didn't teach us as kids, then how are we expected to know that? Exactly. So I think we're on 30 somethings now. So this is typically the time where obviously, again, everyone's life varies, but I feel as though people might be more settled in their career. They might be looking at having a family or not, where they want to live, those kind of things. What would you recommend there? What I typically see with my 30 somethings is that is the average time that we are starting family formation now. So to your point, having kids and, and at that point in time, I think a lot of people say, I don't need a financial advisor because I don't have money to invest. Well, that's not the only reason to go and get a financial advisor. When you're in your 30 somethings and you're starting that family formation That is the perfect time to get a relationship with a financial advisor so you can be more intentional with your future plans and how they're laid out because there's things that need to come along with family formation like getting a will. And if you have kids, if something were to happen to you both, God forbid, who is going to take care of your your kids? 
So there's a lot of things outside of just the actual investing of the money that needs to be addressed and planned for. Would you also recommend 529 plans at that point if people are able to? Yes. As soon as I got social security cards for both of my children, we opened a 529 plan. And the reason that that is my favorite vehicle for college planning is we We'd all like to think that our babies are going to be perfect angels as they get older, but sometimes they may choose a different path. And the 529 plan keeps us in control of that money. So if they did happen to choose that different path, having that big lump sum of money at their fingertips could be a detriment in that situation. I think that's such a great point. And so many people don't realize that, that the 529, even if it is in their, for the benefit of their child, that to your point, if for some reason you decide not, it's not the right time, or it never will be the right time that you, you do have control of the money. So there's really no reason if you can afford to, to put that money away. Absolutely. And I always recommend, even if you could put $25 a month into that plan because with my kids, I show them their statements and I show them, and that's my, my take on making sure that as their mom and also being a certified financial planner, that that's the legacy I'm leaving with them is they will understand finance. And so they get to have fun looking at their money and how it's invested and Ooh, it's been down last year, but look, it's come up this quarter. So it's fun for them to look to. Oh, that's great. 40s. What do you typically see there for women? 40s. And this is me now. The biggest thing, I myself went through this. I think women, we naturally are more nurturing. We naturally, for the kids, and it's not always like this, but We're the ones often planning the birthday parties for the kids and changing out seasonal clothes and, oh my gosh, you've already grown out of those shoes and doctor's appointments and doctor's appointments. And then as a wife, we're also trying to be a good wife. And if you're a daughter, if you're a friend, you're, you tend to, at this season of life, get a bit lost. I think that we growing up age 18, okay, there's a goal. I'm going to graduate high school and then I'm going to go to college and then I'm going to go get a job and I'm going to find my life partner and I'm going to have kids. And there's a list of these goals that our society already kind of lays out for us. But what happens when you've checked all of those boxes And you've lost yourself a bit because you've been planning for everyone else in your life except for yourself. So at this point in time in the 40s, my biggest piece of advice would be take a lot of time to reflect on who you are, who you've become, and what this next season of life looks like for you. Then from there... And this is what I do with my clients. We create vision boards. Yes, I wanted to get to that. That's so cool. Yeah, there we go and and have the money match those visions. But if we don't have those pictures in our head, it's very daunting and it's a very lonely feeling. Yes. Is this when you typically see most women pivot jobs in their 40s? I wouldn't say that I see them mostly pivoting in their 40s. I don't think I've I've recognized that. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. In one's fifties, that's we're getting a little closer to I mean people work on and on, but a little closer to retirement age. The fifties is what I often see kind of like I mentioned the Coca-Cola employee example. They've been doing what they were told to do. I've been maxing out my 401k and I've stuck with this career and I've been here for 20 or 30 years and they are recognizing that retirement is closer than they think. 
And that may be because a forced retirement that they've gotten laid off. That may be as we get older and health issues start to arise, that that is a forced retirement. My biggest piece of advice there would be to, again, work with someone and and lay out your financial picture and understand the purpose behind every single dollar that you have saved and how it's going to work. I tell my clients all the time, my job is to help you make educated decisions for yourself. I want to give you a 30,000 foot view of education so you can be able to make those decisions for yourself. So just know you're going to feel better having that peace of mind and having a plan laid out. Oftentimes, I see clients in that age, it's either a reality check, oh my gosh, I can't retire in five years like I thought, because health insurance is now almost like a mortgage payment. You need to be clear on what that looks like. So you would go through that with your clients and really look at the real numbers, not kind of what we think it's going to be, but. That is exactly it. That's really when you start pulling in the real numbers, we're logging into their social security account to see what is that going to look like. I'm having them log into their pension estimator that they've never done before. How much is that pension really going to pay out? I'm logging in and looking at all of their investments wow, did you know that you're still invested as if you were 20 years old? And if we went through another 2008, the biggest recession since the Great Depression, and you lost 40% of this money, can you still handle that at this season of life? It's, so you're right, definitely looking at the real numbers now. The real numbers, and we'll just do, I don't mean to lump 60 and everyone else together, but just for the sake of time, What do you typically look at at that point of life, 60 and above? This is really when I like to have my couples come back together on what the vision of their future looks like. Because let's say you have a married couple and they've been married for 40 years. When is the last time that they've sat down and talked about what retirement looks like to them? I've had the husband or the, one of the spouses may say, oh, I want to retire in the mountains. Definitely. I'm going hunting and fishing. And the wife is saying, I hate the mountains. I want to retire at the beach. That is a huge disconnect. And oftentimes I become a therapist in that situation for the 60s and above I think the number one thing is to, you're never too old to still have dreams. I often see that they become scared, like life is over. Well, gosh, when I retire, I don't want to just sit in my recliner watching daytime TV all day, but especially more for the men, I see them not wanting to retire. What am I going to do with my days? So just making sure that you have that clear vision of what your ideal day is going to look like, because statistics show that if you don't have some kind of routine set up within 60 days of retiring, the chances of you retiring in that recliner watching daytime TV every day are pretty high versus you thinking, okay, this has been the time I've always wanted to learn how to garden. And I've always wanted to get up in the morning and go ride an e-bike and coming up with those visions. And then in your ideal day, when are you making time for those passions then? What I'm hearing from you is, is so much about relations, relational instead of transactional, which I think is so key to working with anyone with your money, because you have to have that kind of relationship and rapport with them. Absolutely. And that is the key to how I wanted to make my business different. I call it humanizing my industry. I wanted to humanize it and I wanted to take such an intimidating topic that 
Most people, when you're sitting at the dinner table with your friends, our money is such a hush hush because we don't know. The biggest question that I hear is, is this average? Is this for my age? Is this the amount of money that you're seeing other people have? And so they want to feel like they're normal. So being able to humanize this and let them know they are not alone Just because you don't have that will in place or you don't know what a mutual fund is, you should not feel bad about that. You are not alone. Investing is is not, I mean, obviously they're complex instruments, but like basic equities, it's not terribly complicated to learn with a financial advisor. Absolutely. And you can make it as complicated as you want. So you can go and search on Google and come up with 5,000 different definitions of these investment vehicles. But you just really need to understand the ones that are best suited for you because they're not going to be the same that are best suited for your sister or your neighbor or your friend. That makes so much sense. And over this past year, I I know I've looked at my own portfolio, which um, has probably lost, I think, 15 or, or 20 percent. And it's a paper loss, sure, but it still kind of makes me uncomfortable. I'm sure that you have some clients that come to you in fear. How do you handle that? By focusing the conversation back to their goals. So the first thing that I would say is if you had come to me after this past year where there was really nowhere to hide in the markets, everything was down. I would bring you back to reality and say, okay, do you need all of this money next year? And you're going to say, no, this is the money that I'm going to be living off of for the next 30 years. Then, okay, we have a bucket of money that is set up for your first five years worth of income. And this bucket of money has downside protection on it. We're not really concerned. We've got that covered. We're not having to take money income out of our income now bucket in a down market. And then we have other buckets of money that are more growth oriented. So in order to have that reward, you do have to take a bit of risk, but we don't want to do that in the immediate money that we need. I would bring my clients back to their goals, number one, and show them the bu- their buckets and remind them that they are okay. And that's really all they need is to be talked off the ledge and to feel heard and understood and that they are important and you are explaining and answering all of the questions that they have. That makes so much sense. And you're right. There has been nowhere to hide. (laughs) Most definitely. You probably know that better than any of us. Mindset is the last question I wanted to ask you about before we tell listeners where they can learn more about working with you. Mindset is such a a key, it plays a key role in how people relate to money. Are there common self-sabotaging behaviors that you help your clients overcome? And if so, what are they? Yes. So common self-sabotaging behaviors would be, I think, There is so much negativity in the world, unfortunately. So we've got the media, we've got our devices that when something happens in China, we know instantly here, we've got the social media that could cause a divide. When we wake up and we fill our minds with all of this negativity, then comes the fear. And when we get that fear in our heads, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose all of my money. What if I lose my house? What if, what if, what if, what if? Instead, what we should be focusing on is the positives. Let's reflect and look how far we've come. So if you just retired and you were able to save this huge nest egg for yourself and pay off your mortgage. Let's focus on that. And there's always going to be something going on 
everywhere in the world. There's always going to be an election or a war that's causing market volatility. And sometimes we just need to to turn that off. And I'm not saying by sticking our heads in the sand, but focusing more on the positive and reflecting more on our accomplishments and being proud of ourselves. I love that. And you made me think back to my father and he would invest in the 80s. And and that was a time where you wouldn't know until the next day (laughs) what the stock price did. And you're so right that now the world is moving at such a fast pace all the time. You're being inundated, inundating with information. It can really lead to a lot of overwhelm and paralysis. I tell my clients all the time, I wish they only looked at their statement one time per year because that would save a lot of heart attacks that they're feeling throughout the year. If you think of 2020, when we had a global pandemic, when you were looking at your accounts in March and April, people were feeling helpless. I'm going to lose everything. And fast forward, if they if they would have not looked at any of that, by the end of the year, their accounts, our portfolios were up. Not to say that there wasn't anything to worry about during a global pandemic, but as far as their accounts, they would have saved a lot of heartache. And I have some clients who will go in and look at their investments daily and some who say, nope, I don't want to see. I'm going to do like you said, and I'm just going to trust that this is the path and the investment course that I'm supposed to be on. What, as we wrap up and you tell listeners where they can find out more about you, I always like to ask the women that I have on my show, what is one tip that you would have given your younger self? And it can be professional, personal. One tip. Oh, that's a big question. My tip would be to just be yourself from the beginning. It feels so much better. And I hate that I had to wait to get into my 40s to have the confidence that I have now, the confidence in my body, the confidence in my brain, the confidence in being a mom. Uh, I now, I don't wear suits to work. If I feel like wearing bright red lipstick, then I'm going to wear it. If I'm 5'10", I used to not wear heels because I didn't want to be taller than maybe my male clients. I'm going to wear heels. I wish as my younger self that I wasn't hiding behind those suits and putting my hair up in a bun and throwing those glasses on. I would have just been more authentic. Thank you for being so authentic today. I really appreciate it. And where can listeners find out more about you? On our website would be the best place at timewisefinancialllc.com. I have a lot of videos on there. We have a blog page that my team and I post monthly educational videos that could be very helpful for listeners to go and and take a look at. I agree. I did look at a few before our interview. They are very interesting and informational. Highly recommend them. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to She Ventures. Like what you heard? You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and sign up for our newsletter so you never miss a show.